Welcome. Um, my name is Isaac Zablocki. I'm the director of the Carol Zabar Center for Film at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. And this is a program that is part of our Other Israel Film Festival in collaboration with the New Israel Fund and many, many more partners um, who have joined on to do this, I think, perfectly timed um, as things are heating, heating, heating up in Israel for the fourth election series um, going on right now. Um, you know, I think they were getting bored with Netflix. So they were like, let's, let's have another election um, uh, program so we can uh, have, have uh, some new things to see. And uh, that's why we were happy to provide this series of films on leaders. Um, and they'll be available till election, through election day, till um, March 23rd. So you can check out all of the films. Please tell your friends and help spread the word about the series. Um, it's uh, really been fascinating for me to revisit all of these films. And, um, and I'm excited to um, have these conversations and to um, continue discussing and I think reflecting on everything that's going on in our world right now as far as uh, Israeli politics, I think uh, even, even leaders of past very much resonate um, for today. Um, I'll share that we're just about to announce our, um, our April um, season of film. So please check your emails. Um, we'll be having those up soon. Um, we have a lot of exciting films coming up. Also still running is the film Till Kingdom Come, which is now in release. You can check that out at jccfilm.org. Um, and of course, as part of this uh, Israeli Leaders series, next week we still have one more conversation and that is with uh, Comrade Dov, which is about um, Knesset member Dov Hanin, former Knesset member Dov Hanin. So that will be March 22nd, just before the elections at 3 p.m. And that'll be run by our partners um, with the new Israel Fund. Um, Right now we have um, Honorable Men, The Rise and Fall of Eud Olmert. I think in some ways, this is, this is definitely the newest film in the group. And in some ways, I, I think one that plays up most, uh, most to our reality today and tells a fascinating story again in kind of two parts. Um, really the first part telling the story, a little bit of Eud Olmert and his leadership as a prime minister. And the second part really focusing on his trial. And um, I'm really excited to have here today the director of the film, Roni Abulafia. Roni, thank you so much for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. Folks, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'd like to make you a part of this conversation and we will call on you once uh, we get to that part. Um, so Ronnie, tell me, let's first of all, just start with uh, where I started as far as the um, telling of the story and having those two parts, which I found really fascinating. Each one is a movie onto itself and kind of stands alone but uh, maybe a little bit about um, how you made that decision to split it into these two parts. Um, we were, after, after the main part of the shooting and after we did most of the interviews and after um, we had all those, uh, I had all those telephone conversations with uh, Eud Olmert when he was in jail. I mean, we, we were struggling in the edit room uh, um, trying to figure out how to tell the story because we had this, we had this uh, one, um, one part where um, that, that dealt with the time that he was a prime minister and um, everything that he did as prime minister and his um, decision to move forward with the peace process and to really try to reach a peace agreement with the Palestinians and kind of um, I'm going to be, I'm going to solve the biggest problem um, that, that I think that Israel has and, um, and how um, right wing in Israel got very uh, upset with that and was were trying to um, take him down in every way they could. So we had this one um, very um, um, substantial part. And then we had the part where um, they were, 
where um, after he after he um, was no longer prime minister, um, his trials began, and we couldn't leave that leave it leave it at that. We couldn't leave it uh, end the film after the first part ends because that would have, would have been um, not a not not a real. Um, um, not the real story of what happened because it wasn't only this very um, um, uh, smart and shrewd politician who could have almost gotten peace with the Palestinians and who bombed the nuclear reactor in uh, in Syria, um, although Bush um, told him not to actually. Uh, he was also a, a corrupt man who and was found guilty of um, of um, of um, many uh, of of a few charges or many charges, and so we had to kind of tell that part. And that part had a had I guess a, um, well in the beginning I thought that uh, people would really be interested in the in the peace process and why we don't have peace and but and, and but eventually after the after we finished it i, I saw that that the, the the story of the family the rivalry between the two brothers um how the how his um his brother yossi got him actually in trouble and um and 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 the rivalry that started when they were very young children ended up being the thing that uh, actually um, actually um, made him fall. Um, and, and so we had this, uh, the rivalry between the brothers, that was one thing. And then there was this, the loyal assistant, Shula Zaken, who was a very powerful woman in, in Eud's office and, uh, and and, and her loyalty to him up until the end where she um, decides to uh, betray that loyalty and, um, and become a state witness. So that was kind of, actually it was a courtroom drama, but it was also um, an, uh, a very um, human drama that uh, people could relate to. So that's kind of how it got, uh, to be two parts and kind of different in, in subject matter and in atmosphere. And I think, I think they, they work and you need one part to understand the other part. And, um, yeah. and, and I, I really enjoyed both parts separately. Um, I think I, <laughs> I kind of want to talk about each part separately. Um, so let, let's talk about, a little bit about that, that first part. Um, where, where we see um, really, I mean, both we, we get Eud's story a little bit, um, Ulmert's story, and um, a little bit of his, of how he, his leadership as far as when he's, um, his, the, what, when, what went on while he was prime minister and kind of what he was trying to push. And one of the things that really struck me was, I, I think it was, it looks like in the film, that it was one of his um, acceptance speeches um, um, with, uh, as the leader of Kadima, where he is talking about um, his goal as a prime minister as far as um, making a final deal with the Palestinians, call it peace. And that is something that today, none, I mean, I'm following a little bit of the election campaigns. Nobody's talked about in at least the last three campaigns. Um, nobody's talking about the, pal the word Palestinians is not even mentioned. Um, I, I thought- like, uh, so, like science fiction. Right, right. Now, even though it was only 12 years ago. Exactly. I thought I thought this would be I thought, you know, you'd think this was from the 1970s in a different world. But it was it was 12 years ago, not so long ago. And he is he just made that his his did that stand out for you as you were telling the story? Did it seem odd to you at all? Yeah, I think for me personally, I wasn't aware while well, things were happening in 2006, 2007, I wasn't really aware of how um, how um, 
how much he did try to move to make this uh, the peace process move forward, and I wasn't really much aware, uh, really aware of it. Um, so that surprised me when I found out about it. And I think he's this kind of man um, that um, that has like you guys in English have a really good word. It uh, that it's like, I guess, boldness or grit. Um, it's kind of courage, but it's courage with also with some some something uh, else. And I and I think that uh, when he got to to be prime minister by accident, this guy was kind of became prime minister by accident when uh, Sharon had uh, had his stroke. And um, I think he had he got he did decide he was shifting from the right to the left in in the few years before that, and I think he did decide that he's gonna solve the um, the their most urgent problem that Israel has in his eyes, which was the uh, try to make a deal with the Palestinians and try to make a final status deal, not like. Not, not, uh, not like the Oslo process that had um, that had like steps. Um, right. Not, not uh, drag it out. Just yeah. So just let's. I'll, I'll sit with the guy and I'll and I'll be able to talk to him and and we'll be able to cut a deal somehow and we'll we'll and it's gonna be maybe it's gonna maybe be painful. Maybe it has a lot of. It, it carries a lot of risk because when a process like this fails, it's all, it always fails. The failure uh, brings on violence. So it has a lot of risk, but I think he did decide he's not gonna be just warming the chair as prime minister is gonna do something uh, meaningful. And uh, that's kind of the good, I mean, that's describing the, um, the good mm -hmm. part of these traits. But I think the same traits also, or the same characteristics also are the ones that got him in trouble because he's uh, somebody that, um, that thinks he can um, control everything and that he, and he, be, he believes that, um, that uh, things have to be, um, things have to be cut uh, quickly, doesn't believe in process, or maybe, I mean, due process is not always, you know, a first, uh, um, um, first priority, he believes that if it's, if the, if the, like, let's say they need in the finance ministry to make a decision or in the Jerusalem municipality, it's better to make the decision than to wait for all the process to go on forward, the justice, uh, the um, counselors of all kinds. So I think it's the same, the, that same trait could have made him a very, a great prime minister, but also um, got him in trouble. Very interesting. Um, why do you think he made that move from, I mean, he was, he was pretty strong to the right. And made yeah, this move, yeah. which um, which is, I'd say, pretty strong to the left. Um, the Kadima was considered to be somewhere in the middle. Um, Very strong, right now. Yesterday, he announced on TV that he's gonna vote for Berav Michaeli, the Labour Party. Can you imagine? Is uh, like, is one of the, is from one of the families that uh, founded Chirut, and uh -huh. so. I think I think the um, um, he he made he he made this move because as he was mayor of Jerusalem, I think he's very pro pragmatic man. He's not a very ideologic man. He's very pragmatic and he's not in any way religious. So I think while he was uh, uh, mayor of Jerusalem, he he was trying to make this work. This is a unified city, and we're um, we're talking. We're um, very proud. We united it, and it's important for 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 us for where he, where he came from um, that Jerusalem would be united forever. And um, but the mayor has to um, to uh, 
take care of education, take care of, um, of tavrua, zevel, you know, all kinds of the, <laughs> of uh, municipal Garbage things. and yes. Yeah, so. gar take out the garbage and that kind of stuff. And, and he was able, I think he, did, he saw that the two parts will never be actually, that he couldn't offer the services that he could offer in the western part of Jerusalem to the eastern part of Jerusalem. And I, th I think that kind of made him understand that, uh, I mean, any realistic person, when you, look, when you look at Jerusalem, you can see that this is not, something is not working. You, it's, not, it's not really unified. So I think that kind of the, the pragmatism brought on a change. If, if only everyone was so pragmatic, um, everyone in Israeli politics. Everybody, no, I think that, you know, if, if, he knew, if he was able to realize that everybody is, was able to, I was actually pretty angry with him when we talked about it because I was like saying, but it's not like nobody, I was thinking it's not like nobody was, I mean, you could, you could have figured it, this out before because there were people um, talking about this before. People, people have raised those issues before. So I was kind of angry with him for not, I mean, but, and his answer was always, I can't, you have to understand, I came from this very revisionist right-wing family and from where I was um, raised in, that was the narrative, so. So, so something else that was um, fascinating um, to me in the film was, um, I'll call him the character of um, Aviad Visuli, is that how his name is yeah. pronounced? Mm -hmm. um, and he is, he is the um, kind of right-wing um, retiree who has dedicated his life to bringing down folks who, like Ulmer, who dare to try to push peace in any way. Right. Um, he, you couldn't have cast that character better if it wasn't a documentary. Um, yeah. he, was very surprising. He, he, is, he seems very happy to share all and almost proud of it. What, what do you make of that? Um, I think he's, he is very proud. I think he feels that he saved um, Eretz Israel the land of Israel and he saved the settlement, the settlement project. I think they saw Olmert as a real uh, danger because I think, be, because Olmert was a very, he was a very strong prime minister. He had a, like at, at some point Lieberman joined and they, he had 74 seats in his coalition. So he was very strong politically. And he was, he's very, he's been all his life in politics. So he had many allies and he was a very good operative in the political arena. So I think they were very afraid of him. And he was, uh, he acted like, uh, like crazy, you know, in the film, you can see what he did with Amona when you, when he- That's a settlement that was taken to, apart. Yeah, to take apart the settlement, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of them. He was. Uh, he thought this was the right thing to do, and he did it with uh, with a lot of violence, very bad, very bad violence. I mean, he could, um, so I think they were really afraid of him. So, and I think Aviad Visoli. I know that Aviad Visoli is very proud of what he did, and he's he's he's. A, doing uh, similar things right now. I mean, you can't stop. I, I, I don't know how, how much uh, you're involved with uh, Israeli politics and the uh, Netanyahu trial, but um, these are the people that are digging dirt on uh, Netanyahu's, uh, Netanyahu's prosecutor, for example, Liat Ben Ari. And, so, uh, so he's he's of course defending he would want, he's defending Netanyahu and trying to bring everyone yeah. else down. Net Netanyahu would be he's his not, choice. He's not completely happy with Netanyahu because Netanyahu is not right wing enough for him. Um, he he 
he really wanted him to um, to uh, annex last year it was mm -hmm. and there was this uh, part of phase where there was a possibility maybe to annex so it so I think he's disappointed with Netanyahu but he's um, helping him in his the trial is I mean he doesn't believe that Netanyahu is a corrupt man so right only, only people who want to do peace are corrupt um, and and what is this organization? What is his organization? I don't. I, I actually didn't know much about him before. Before well, this, it was kind of. Yeah, I I didn't know much about him either. He's a kind of a, a man in the shadows. He's he's a member of uh, of the Central Likud of Likud, and he's he has an organization called the um, the a Forum Amishpati Leman Eretz Israel. Um, the judicial forum for, for the state of Israel. of Israel. So they, they, uh, yeah, they do, they do, um, they uh, uh, go to the high court to, you know, they do all kinds of things like that for, for the settlement project. Very interesting. And this leads me to my next question, which was the amazing access. So you had great access to him and great access to all sides. It seems that you really were able to get access to everybody. I mean, from both both Shula Zaken, um, uh, Olmert's uh, um, assistant and and Olmert himself, everybody was really um, giving their voice here. What, uh, what allowed you to have such uh, in-depth access? Um. I had I know Olmert's it's it all started because I know Olmert's daughter and when he was going to jail right before he went to jail they wanted to the family wanted to do some video with him and so he so she asked me for help and then um, that's that's how I I of course um, after I finished shooting the video for them I I told him, let's do, let's, I asked him if he would do a film. And that was uh, about a month before he went to jail. And we had decided that we'll, we'll speak uh, from jail once a week. And then sort of recorded phone interviews. Um, Which so is, is not great for visuals. No, it's not great for visual, but it has a lot of uh, dramatic tension. The yeah. same, even when you don't speak about a, a very important things. Um, so it kind of, I kind of, I think, build up the trust um, through those uh, phone conversations, and um, and uh, I was sorry that the family didn't want to be in the film. I mean his wife and his children. I thought their, their perspective would have been interesting, but they, they're very private people and they somehow managed to stay, up, stay out of this publicly. So they didn't want to be in the film. And, um, and Aviad Visoli, that, uh, that uh, right uh, wing, um, guy that dug up dug up uh, the dirt on him that was a real surprise because somebody had told me you know there was this really the people were talking about this concerted effort to find the incriminating material about Ormelt but I, I couldn't find um, proof of that and um and somebody told me, um, you should talk to this and that lawyer. And I talked to that lawyer and he, that lawyer mentioned a few names. So we started calling up the names that he mentioned. And when we got to this guy of Yadvisoli, it was just, oh yeah, it was me. <laughs> mm. So uh, I was really, I mean, excited about that. And Shula, Shula is a tough cookie. <laughs> She had all kinds of uh, conditions, and there was a there were, there was a very long uh, negotiation with her, but finally she did it. Um, 
she's she's definitely an interesting character and it's interesting even the way she's positioned in the film um she's kind of uh, i would say you feel like there's the most conditions there she seems the most like rehearsed and um uh and kind of um like placed in a very specific way um yeah i was as i was telling you that about almost but i was really hoping that from from all of the people that I interviewed, they would they would be able to to look like um, look back, you know, ten years have passed. That some of them were in jail, some of them, you know, so many things happened, and so I I was hoping they would be able to be more contemplative about it, more like looking back, saying maybe. Maybe this was a mistake. Maybe that was a mistake. I see things differently now, but no, everybody was very fixed on their narrative, on the on their um, position. So with Shula, it was really tough because she was uh, she had this uh, after she became a state a state's witness. She had this. Uh, she built up this new. Um, narrative for herself and she was really you know I she was really following that and giving that in the interview interesting um and we talked a little bit about this before but I'd love to hear I, I have to say that the the the, um, the um the conflict I had with her was that she was actually also convicted of she of corruption and she and that that you wouldn't talk about i mean that was her, that was the conflict with her mm -hmm. that's, she, that's she where she cut the interview every time and um what were their reactions to the film i'm curious shula Shula, I mean, we talked a little bit before um, uh, before we got on here um, about um, Olmert's reaction. Oh, Olmert, um, yeah. Olmert, was Olmert, was Olmert and, and Shula. Olmert, of course. Olmert wasn't very happy. I mean, he was happy. I was kind of happy with the first part because the first part is, uh, you know, I think he comes out very well from that um, as like, being persecuted maybe for trying to do the right thing. Um, but the second part he wasn't happy about. He, in Hebrew, the film is called uh, which means um, the man that wanted too much. Did you say that, Isaac? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plays nicely off of the man who knew too much. I yeah. So, so very, very Hitchcocking. Yeah, so that he didn't like that at all, and he didn't like the way he was the way he came out of the second part. Um, how how did uh, Shula did she approve it? Shula, I actually haven't heard from her. I heard from her son. Was very unhappy. Uh, I have to say, I, I told you this earlier, we were presenting here this week, all these films about different leaders in Israel. And of course, um, it's important to have a critical position when you're looking at your leadership. And I think that's part of what makes a democracy great. And I think this film gives a really, I, I would say, I mean, first of all, Drew um, Eil Dolmert's um, um, prime ministry in a whole new light for me. And I think brought it, uh, brought it. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of justice. I think you know a lot of people are going to just remember um, his um, his being sentenced, um, the corruption, being sentenced to jail. But I think I think um, it really gave um, his perspective and a lot of sympathy towards him. Which, I mean. You you don't want to overfeed it and overkill it and try to you know turn him into a hero when when people know the reality or or have, have seen the reality that was uh, at least um, passed through the journalism, the journalists. But they but I think it really gave um, a, a somewhat um, good perspective um, of Olmert and um, and I'm, I'm sorry he didn't like it more. I think so too. I mean Israel is very um, polarized. 
I mean, you know, I mean, uh, the U.S. is also Israel is very polarized, and um, right now it's very hard. Um, it's very hard to to tell a complicated story because, especially, a character like Eld Olmert is either a, a villain or a, a tzaddik. Um, right. A righteous person. Many people that think he's an angel, a, but <laughs> most of the people think he's a villain. But um, I think he was a good prime minister, and that gets him very angry. Um, also, when because a lot of people say, "Oh, he was a good, great prime minister because he's a good manager. He's he had he's a courageous, and he also, he's also a good manager." So. Um, that's get that gets him very angry because he understands that when people saying oh he was a good prime minister they mean it as opposed to um, what happened later as opposed to how corrupt a, uh, a person he is um, i think it's that's really on the point um i'd like to take some questions from the audience and allow you guys to be a part of this conversation um, so we're going to start with Ellen. Ellen, your mic is unmuted. Oh, you have to unmute your mic. Okay. Am I unmuted now? Unmuted? Yes. Hear okay. you. Um, I guess another question, uh, well, my question was, you had some footage of when people were, when I can put my video on, maybe. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, in, the inter in, in the courtroom, when they were talking to people, how did you get that kind of footage? And at one point, they were very aggressive with one of the women, and I wonder were they equally aggressive with with the men people they were talking to. Um, at the very end, they talked about Shula having an affair with this guy with from Holy Land, and mm -hmm. that she had taken bribes. So was all of that proved, or did that just sort of fade away at the end because so many other things were going on, and because he died, and so I guess they lost evidence and they lost the ability to prosecute further. No, that was um, the fact that he died should have been actually um, a court should the um, the fact that he died should have um, should have uh, dropped. I mean that that should have dropped. They should have dropped the case, regardless of whether Olmert is corrupt or not, because. Uh, because Olmert and also some of the other people that were prosecuted did not get a chance to cross-examine him. And this is a very basic part of the, of the, of the judicial system. Uh, a person that is prosecuted has a right to cross-examine the witness that is accusing him. So that, that should have had, that should, the fact that he died should have canceled the trial actually but it didn't because it's very complicated when uh, when um, um, when a, a political figures are being put, put on trial and uh, stakes are so high for everybody um, it, I mean he lost so much imagine if they would cancel the trial and the, and the prosecutors had invested so much in this. So it gets very complicated. And I think that um, my, my, uh, my uh, view of this uh, after investigating the cases against him for such a long time is that we should have a, um, prime ministers should not be should be able, I mean, it's called the French law here because they have it in France. I mean, they have, the prime minister should have uh, only two uh, terms like you guys have in the US. And, and while, while these two, two terms are going on, they, they shouldn't be prosecuted because that. That's, that's what, we hear you. Ronnie? I can't hear. Um, you can't hear us? Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you, but I can't hear Ellen. I think her oh. mic is muted. Her mic is probably muted. Yeah. We, we, we mute them again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm sure I know Netanyahu was pushing for that for that law to change. And yeah, um, it just, it, it, uh, it, since um, 
since pros um, prosecution and uh, criminal charges and corruption investigations have become such a political tool, I think the, polit the, the system has to sort this out because it's crazy. I think definitely putting a limit so people can't yeah. go on being prime ministers forever. That's definitely one side of it. Um, but yes, I, I think the film does expose kind of this really crazy system. Like, you know, you don't like who's prime minister. Okay, you'll start collecting information and offering bribes and getting police to investigate anyone who had anything, any dealings with, uh, with these people in the past and nobody will ever get anything done. Right, there are lots of examples. I mean, even in the US, I mean, the, I guess the, I think from, from the little I know, the investigations, let's say into, uh, into Hillary Clinton's emails have lost the election for her. So, I mean, you can, and, and in the end, it turns out she was okay, right? So it's complicated. Yep. Um, let I, I'll just to follow up a little bit on Ellen's question. Also, the access to the footage was amazing. So the the police had those, Talansky's footage. Yeah, I think we saw Talans. We saw some, the interrogations. You, you used a lot of the live interrogations. Those right. were those were all yeah, recorded um, and and available to you. It was the first time ever that the prime minister. I mean, uh, for an investigation of a prime minister to be shown and on TV and on film. That was kind of a big deal. Um, the investigations are always uh, taped and you have to get court approval to show, to show that, in, to air that. So um, we got a court approval for, for it because um, this has, um, it, 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 it's a public interest. I mean, it's not such a, some anonymous uh, person. Uh, it's it's the public interest, and and I, I had found that was also a, a a very amazing moment of discovery because as I was sorting out this legal material, I had found um, DVDs, and I and when I and they were like in a very old format. It was complicated to play them, but when I played them, I found that it was. Um, Morris Delansky's um, 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 edut, his, um, his, his, uh, his testimony. Testimony, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's very rare because in Israel they don't, um, they don't uh, shoot on video uh, court proceedings. So that so that was very rare that that got somehow recorded and that I was able to use that. That was amazing. Yeah, amazing. Um, we have a question from Mati. Mati, you're, yes. you're on the Ronnie, air. Ronnie, there were, I mean, all the interviewees in the movies, most of them were like one-sided. I mean, they had one side or the other. I'm just curious, I mean, could you not get like experts in law like professor in academia or some other more objective uh, opinions on the proceedings or the results or you know whatever legal maneuvering was going on. <laughs> well, I had the defense and I had the prosecution, so th there were the two sides, and I had and I thought there not. And nobody is objective. Nobody is considered objective in these matters in Israel because this is so. It's the the political aspect of it, and the, so every. I mean, the um, every expert or sort of professor that I could talk to would would immediately be um, tagged as uh, one sided for on either side, like let's say uh, um, Friedman, that was the justice minister, let's say, or, or on the other hand, like um, okay, um, um, other experts would. Olmert is, uh, is a subject that everybody has an opinion on. And uh, usually it the, the opinions opinion follows like, also your like um, political preferences. 
So that was kind of right. It's very, I, I was also surprised uh, um, when the film played at Doc Aviv, that was the premiere in September, and I was very surprised how even people, even the press and even, you know, um, couldn't, couldn't look at this look back with a with perspective and not um, not immediately hide behind or fall behind the, the those same lines those same sentences the same words that was kind of disappointing um i, I and i have to say i really have to commend you that you did a great job in bringing in different sides i know i know sometimes it's nice to preach to the choir and to only like bring in your position um, but even more so, I think in Israeli film, you get to see one perspective and not multiple perspectives. And I think this film did a really good job of, of bringing that yeah, in. No, it, was, it was important for me to, 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 invent, I mean, to research this properly and to bring you know, all kinds of perspectives. And this brings me to a question from an audience member that they asked me to read out loud as far as, you know, you're taking in all these perspectives from both sides. And I think that made it not clear of like, you know, where maybe you stand, but the question is, where did you land on the question of Olmert's guilt and have that impact the film, if at all? I think that he, I think he was uh, definitely guilty of, uh, of some of the things he was charged with. Um, but I think he was um, on, but I think he was, how can I say it? I think he was um, um, sentenced harshly, harsher than needed for, for the things that he was found guilty for on. For. Um, so, and and I think I and I think I said it before. I think that the the mix of politics and um, justice is just uh, things have to be sorted out in a different way because this is not working. Um, the motivation is so high. Um, the the political motivation when you're in power is so high, and then the the justice system's motivations when they start picking up this stuff are also very high. Um, but the the interesting thing about the film was that um, that and that I couldn't plan uh, is that um, as I was I was working on it for four years and as I was working on it, um, Netanyahu's cases started uh, being you know. Um, um, research um, investigative uh, pieces in the press and then the and then police investigations so that kind of mirrored whatever what the, the things that happened with Olmert and that kind of uh, made the film very uh, relevant and very um, very interesting, I think even more interesting. I mean, the comparison was, I mean, was there when you watched it. It's interesting, and but now the people who are trying to accuse Olmert are the same people who are trying to accuse the, um, the, the I guess the prosecutors in Israel. And it's not the same, I mean, there is one prosecutor, she's there, but the rest are not there anymore. And the main, the main uh, prosecutor, uh, Moshe Lado, is not there anymore. Now we have uh, Avichai Mendelblit. And yeah. Avichai Mendelblit is a totally different character. Moshe Lado saw himself as a warrior against corruption. And um, he was very, um, he, wa he wasn't afraid to, to take uh, very aggressive steps um, and I think that Mendelblit is a very much more conservative guy. He's very he 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 um, he he would he he processed Netanyahu's cases very carefully and very slowly, and it took time to think about everything and to to actually understand it and 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 
I think he was he was trying to to make the right choice. Um, so that's completely different. Well, Ronnie, I want to thank you. This film is really fascinating, and I think gives us, uh, shines a real light onto what's going on in the pol Israeli politics right now. Um, people are asking. I know the film's available with us um, for this special program, but where will it be available in the future? It's available in Israel on um, on Channel Eight, and in the States we don't have a um, distribution yet, but um, I'll keep you posted. Um, really, a beautifully made film and um, and a fascinating topic. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you all for being here. Folks, we still have uh, more films till the 23rd, <laughs> till election day. So please join us for the full series. I wanna give a big thank you to the New Israel Fund and to all of our partners who were a part of this and for all of you who are participating. Thank you for, for, for being a part of this. Um, please help spread the word and tell your friends and join us for more screenings um, coming up. And we look forward to seeing you at other Q and A's. Have a good night, everyone. And thank you very much. Good night, Stay everybody. Safe.